Now we're going to look at how we can use the addition method to solve nonlinear systems as well. So addition method, also known as the elimination method, same sort of thing. Now this method works really well when each equation is in or can be rewritten in the same form. Now they don't even have to be exactly the same form. Um, you just need for one of the terms to be able to eliminate just like we did before. Um, so in this example three, you can see that they are the same form. They're both two um, set up with an x squared and a y squared and a constant. The bottom one is a circle, the top one is not. Um, it's gonna make a graph called an ellipse, but again, you don't have to know that. Um, but then on the next example that we'll look at, example four here, even if we rewrite this top one, we're not going to have a y squared and a y squared. We're still going to have a y and a y squared, but we would be able to eliminate the x squared. So you just have to be able to eliminate one of them just like before when using the elimination method. So <clears throat> to solve this one using the elimination method, I'm going to multiply the bottom equation by negative 1. So, oops. If I multiply down here by negative one, then that's gonna give me the system 4x squared plus y squared equals 13. And now I have negative x squared minus y squared equals negative 10. And you can see that the y variables are gonna be the ones to eliminate. And so when we add that together, we get 3x squared, these zero out, equals 3. And we can divide by 3 on both sides and we get x squared equals 1. So now we're going to take the square root of both sides. And don't forget this is the most important thing or you're going to lose half of your ordered pairs. Whenever you introduce the radical, the square root here, we get plus or minus 1 for our solution, not just 1. That means that when we plug back in, we have to plug both positive 1 and negative 1 back into our equation. Now the question is, which equation do we plug into? And of course, it doesn't matter because it should be the same in both. But we're going to check our solutions at the end to be extra sure anyways. I like the bottom one better just because we don't have extra coefficients and things like that. So that's the one that I'm going to use. And so I'm going to start by plugging in when x is equal to positive 1. So when x is equal to positive 1, I get 1 squared plus y squared equals 10. 1 squared is 1, so when I subtract 1 from both sides, we get 9. And then again, we have to take the square root, so we get plus or minus 3. So that means that when x is equal to 1, Okay, with my ordered pair, I either have positive 3 or I have negative 3. So that one solution for x also gave me two different solutions for y. Similarly now, we need to do the same thing and work with x equals negative 1. Well, I'm going to set this up the same negative 1 squared plus y squared equals 10. Negative 1 squared is also positive 1, so when we subtract, we get 9. And so we get the same two possibilities, y equals plus or minus 3, but those are still two new solutions because it's a different x value. So the ordered pairs that we would get there would be negative 1, positive 3, or negative 1, negative 3. And now you can plug those values in again, or we can kind of look at the graph. Now you won't be able to graph equations like this in your graphing calculator because they have to be solved for y. So something like Desmos would be great to look at the graph there. Um, what the graph ends up looking like is, like I said, you're going to have an ellipse, which is an oval shape. And then you have your circle, which looks like this. That's a pretty bad circle, but you get the idea. And so you can see there that it does make sense that we're going to have four solutions. It looks like all four of those seem reasonable. Now, again, what we can do is go and plug those all into the top equation to check as well. Does 4 times 1 squared plus 3 squared equals 13? Yes, it does. 4 plus 9 equals 13. And you can do the same thing with all three points, and you see that when you check 
all four of those end up being viable solutions. So you always need to check, especially when you have a lot like that, we may not need all of them. But this is an example of how you might end up with several solutions depending on the figure that you have. You can imagine that if we took something like a circle um, and took like a sine curve that went through it many, many times like that, you'd end up with a whole bunch of solutions. So there is no limit to the number of times that your curves can intersect depending on the curves, okay? All right, the last example here is another system of nonlinear equations, but this one, we can't quite set them up equally. Now, I'm gonna work this one out both ways using substitution and using elimination because you could really use either one. It's gonna be a matter of personal preference. Um, in the textbook, this is used an example of why elimination might be better. But really, I don't think substitution is any harder if you know how to work with your polynomial. So it's really, you can decide what you like and what you think. So let's look at substitution first, and I'll show you why this may not be the method that you would want to choose. So um, method one would be substitution. The reason why you might be kind of drawn to substitution on this one is because it's already solved for y. So that seems pretty logical. However, you can see pretty quickly when we do that, I have x squared plus x squared plus 3 squared equals 9. You may notice right away that if you square a quadratic, you're going to end up with a quartic equation, meaning you're going to have an x to the fourth power in there somewhere. That may or may not make it more difficult or even in some cases impossible to solve. So you may do this first step and realize I don't like that. I don't want to have that high of a power in my polynomial and scratch that method and go straight to elimination. It didn't bother me so I went ahead forwards with it. Again when we square, square the first that's going to be x to the fourth, square the last that's going to be nine, multiply and double we're going to get six x squared and that equals nine. Well, these are gonna zero out. And so we have x to the fourth plus seven x squared equals zero. Now, to be able to continue forward, you would have to have a strategy to solve this equation. And we do, we can solve this using factoring because these have a GCF of x squared in common. So that gives us x squared plus seven equals zero. So again, what that means is that either x squared equals zero or x squared plus seven equals zero. Now for this equation, x equals zero, that one's pretty easy, but this one, if we subtract seven, we're gonna get x squared equals negative seven, which means we would get imaginary solutions. We are not interested in imaginary solutions here, so this one has no real solutions, which means x equals zero is the only one that we have to worry about. Now we can go back and plug in, if x is equal to zero, that means y is equal to zero squared plus three. So that means y equals three. So zero, three appears to be the only solution there. And we can plug that into the second equation and check it, and we see that it works. Um, if you get to that x to the fourth power and don't know what to do with it, then that means scratch the method you're using and go back to the drawing board and try elimination. So this is what it would look like if you were going to use elimination to solve. Elimination. I got lost in my letters there. Okay, so I need to arrange this so that they're close to the same setup. Right now, like my equal signs, they don't really line up. They're kind of all over the place. So I'm going to subtract x squared from both sides. So now I have negative x squared plus y equals 3. So I have x and y on the same side, both equal to a constant. And down here, I have x and y on the same side, both equal to a constant. So that's good. Now, when I add these together, we see that the x squareds are going to eliminate. That's perfect. However, these are not like terms. That's okay. That just means we can't combine them. 
but now we get y squared plus y equals 12. And that's fine that they're not like terms, but they're still the same variable, so we only have one variable in this equation, which is what we want. Now this is a quadratic. We can just subtract 12. And so this factors to y plus 4 times y minus 3 equals 0. So our two solutions for y are negative 4 and positive 3. And you may say, but wait, when we did it with substitution, we only got one solution, not two. And you're right. So let's work on plugging those y values back in and see what happens. So when I plug in y equals negative 4, um, I'm going to plug that into that top equation that's already solved for y because that seems like the easiest place to put it. So I have negative 4 equals x squared plus 3. I subtract 3 from both sides and I get x squared equals negative 7. Well, again, x squared will never equal a negative number on the real number plane. So this has no real solutions. Since there's no real solutions there, that means I don't have a second half to this ordered pair. So that means I have to throw out y equals negative 4. Not going to work. Then I can plug in y equals 3, and we already know from the first method that that's going to work. Um, if I have 3 equals x squared plus 3, then I subtract, I get x squared equals 0, and we get x equals 0 as our other solution, so 0, 3 is the solution that we get a second time, okay? Um, so in this case, um, you guys always ask me about should you always do substitution? Should you always do elimination? The answer to that is no. It's going to be whichever one makes the most sense for that particular problem. And this is a perfect example of where you may start using one method. Maybe you start using substitution here and you realize that the problem's getting worse for you instead of better. Scratch it and go back and try the other way and it might make your life easier. If you use elimination and the numbers start coming out gross, maybe go back and try substitution. It's, it's really completely up to you which method seems to make the most sense for that particular problem. Um, and so that is what we have got for nonlinear systems. Now, why is this kind of an important thing? In calculus, one of the major applications is that we need to find the area under a curve or oftentimes the area between two curves. There's a lot of applications of that that we're not going to go into now because this is not a calculus class. But if I give you a graph that looks something like this and I want you to find the area of this region, you need to determine what the lower boundary is and what the upper boundary is. And so you'd have to solve that system to find those values because we need to figure out what the interval is over that region right there. Um, and so that is just one of the reasons why nonlinear systems are going to be important. You can see all sorts of applications, um, especially with area. There's a lot of economic formulas that are nonlinear. Again, those are things for another class if you go into those fields. But there are a lot of applications with nonlinear systems, just like the things that we saw with linear systems. Um, and if that's something that interests you, then you should definitely keep studying this so that you get to see some more of those things. So that is what I've got for you for nonlinear systems.